Well, good afternoon, all. I am Johanna Morrow. I'm in the Biology and Environmental Sciences Department here at Westminster College. I want to welcome you to the breakout session featuring Jacob Marsh. But before we begin, just a few reminders. Please go ahead and keep your microphone muted during the talk. There will be time, however, after the talk for questions and answers. So as those questions come to your mind, uh, go ahead and type them into the chat box. And um, after the talk, I'll go ahead and moderate uh, the Q&A. Um, so with that, it's my pleasure today to introduce Jacob Marsh, a Westminster alum from 2008. And Jacob wears many hats in life. He's an author, a business owner, a sustainability seeker, and in keeping with the theme of the Hancock, Hancock Symposium, um, he too is a visionary. Um, so after graduating from Westminster College, Jacob successfully transitioned his senior thesis into his memoir, which he titled In the Weeds. In the Weeds was published in 2013. Additionally, Jacob has successfully launched two companies. Uh, the first, Fight Back Bed Bug Removal in Denver, Colorado, which has recently expanded into Boulder, Colorado and Las Vegas, Nevada, as well as Bully Human, a search engine optimization company. So on behalf of Westminster College, please join me in welcoming Jacob Marsh. Jacob, I give the floor to you. <laughs> Hi, thank you, Joe. Um, so yeah, thank you for having me here. I think as a college student, I think one of your dreams is when you see somebody present is like maybe one day my college will ask me to present and how cool will that be? And to be asked to do this was really an honor and I really appreciate it. Um, but yeah, I graduated in 2008 with a degree in international business with an emphasis in German and English with an internet, uh, emphasis in journalism. Um, it got interesting after that because I got a couple jobs in the field. I got a job as a staff writer for Town's newspaper. I got a job with HR um, for the Muscular Dystrophy Association, which sounded like the dream a little bit for me. And I kind of hated them both. Um, it turns out desk jobs weren't at all for me. And so I just sat here with this really awesome education and didn't quite know what to do with it because uh, what I thought was my passion didn't transfer to my job like I thought it would. And so I kind of had two choices after college. I could go to grad school and try to do the professor thing, uh, or I could just go somewhere and try something else. Um, so I decided to just pick up and go to Colorado and just see what happened. And that was kind of the first time I did a trust fall with the world and like just to see if the world would hold me. I think when you're, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old, like you've, you've been at home, you've been at college, your meals have been fed, you don't quite trust the world to, to hold you. You don't trust yourself in the world fully. Um, and I was very glad I hit Colorado because it's treated me very well in that time. And, but the problem is, and I think the kids today, like whenever you come out of college, you're going to hit what I hit, which was in 2008, we nailed the recession. So I came out of college with a great degree, but then I was going against people who just lost their jobs, especially in journalism. Um, there was just no jobs to be found. I was overqualified for the good jobs. I was underqualified for the, the good jobs and overqualified for the bad jobs. And I couldn't find anything to do. And with the recession going, like th none of my generation could. So we kind of quickly had to find a different way to do things, a different way to be happy, a different way to make money, a different way to save money. Um, and honestly, I think it was kind of the best thing for us. And I'm really like, I'm really excited in this weird way for you all coming out of college right now, because what we were promised, at least for me in my opinion, what I was promised didn't really happen. Um, like I got a 4.0 in college. I was editor of the school newspaper. I had the internships and then I didn't get the jobs. And then nobody cared about that stuff. And I didn't have the money. And so like, what did we have to do? Like my generation, we had to like do cooperative living situations. We had to learn how to like, deal with living with each other and conflict resolution and trying to be adults in this way where we had to support each other um, when we had to find happiness through other things other than money. So we've got a lot of artists coming in and a lot of like music was happening. It was really great. And we went to kind of what we loved because like if we can't get the money, if we can't get the jobs and the cars, like how do we, how do we be happy? And so you just go to what we love. And it also kind of made us distrust the status quo a little bit, like distrust the idea that 
everything they said would happen because it didn't. <laughs> so um, we just kind of had to like pave our own way. And I'm really excited for this next generation because what I had was a light version of I think what's about to happen. Um, and I quickly just realized that after that, like I got to find a new avenue of this, a new way, a new markers of success. Like, what do I want? Like, it turns out, like when I really look at it, I don't care about a big house. I don't care about a nice car. I don't care about all that stuff. Um, which was cool because you're just ingrained in the society through advertising and everything that that is what it is. Um, so I just knew Marcus says, and I just sat down and was like, what do I really want in life? Like just random things. And like, I realized I hated waking up to an alarm clock, just despised it. It made my day start horribly. So like, okay, I don't want to wake up to an alarm. Great. I don't really want to know what day it is. Don't really want to know what week it is. If you know, if I forget what month it is, that's, that's fine too. Um, I just want to be more capable. I realized I went to like, I went to school for 18 years of my life and I didn't know how to do anything with my car or plumbing or electricity or building or anything like that. And I kind of wonder like how did I go to school so long and learn so little practical things. So I just want to learn how to be capable um, and I wanted to just work less. I feel like the 45, 50 hour work week is not okay really like that's so much of our waking hours is spent at work and i just don't feel that that's fair and i didn't want to own a tie or a suit coat or dress pants or a dress shirt i can i can proudly say that i haven't owned a tie in about a decade and like own two businesses which is pretty great um but i knew that before i had all that like i can't just ask for all that like i had to like put in work so the first thing i did i got the first job i could find and it was with terminex doing pest control, which is not what I had in mind, not what my parents had in mind. Um, <laughs> but uh, it was actually really great doing pest control. They just gave me a, a list of things to do and I went and did them. And then it was done. Then I went home and I didn't have to think about anything. And I really like that. I feel like I was told to go to school so I didn't have to do manual labor so I could get the cushy jet desk job and wouldn't have to work hard. And then I got a job in manual labor, working hard, doing things, solving very real problems, getting paid and then leaving. And I just loved it. I found it wildly fulfilling. I found it so fulfilling to be capable. I found it fulfilling to not be like a cog in this machine, to just like be hired to f solve a problem, solve the problem, and then get paid to solve the problem and walk away. I loved being able to be home and not think about my job all the time. Um, and then I just like, once you get a job in manual labor, you, you realize like, in, in the college and everything, like we're kind of taught to look down on laborers and on the people that do the work. And it's absurd because they're the ones doing the work. They're the ones that are capable. They're the ones that can build the houses. They can do the plumbing. They can do the electricity. And we're over here as the white collar people thinking that we are above them, pay grade, everything like that. And we don't really know how to do much at all except manage it. And it kind of is a racket in some ways. Like, and I, you see that now and it's interesting i had a neighbor named julian who's this like toothless hispanic man um who was ridiculous but he would talk to me about how like he used to build fences and he used to do plumbing and he used to do this and he used to do that and he's had like 20 jobs and i respected that so much i respected that kind of more than somebody that had the same career for 50 years like this guy knew everything and i just like i found myself like envying this toothless guy <laughs> like i want to know all this stuff like i want to know how to build a fence and then I got around these people who were doing that. And it turns out like they know more than just that. And they are so um, willing to teach you everything. And like, I also like, in this recession, like these are recession proof now, like it, the, the middle manager company or the start, like it's hard when it comes to recession, these aren't essential businesses. And now like going to pest control, like it's an essential business. It's, it's something that people will always need. And so if you have this skill set, you will never starve. And that's what I got to this point, realizing that like I am a privileged, capable white man who likes to work. I will never starve. I won't, they won't let me. I've seen, I've seen people on drugs and with mental health issues, like they don't starve. I will not starve. Um, which was wildly empowering for me. Like it, it opened up every other avenue for me, just knowing that I would be okay. Like I will have a, a roof over my head or at least a tent <laughs> and I will not starve. And that's all that really matters. And that's part of this, like the social entrepreneurship aspect of it. Being in pest control kind of blew my mind because I got a job at the Muscle District Association and I wanted to do stuff at the Sierra Club. And I wanted to be in all these um, just obviously socially conscious industries. 
Then I got a job at Terminex and it's like, wait, like people are needed in every industry. People are needed to do their job and do their job well. That's it. That's changing the world right there. And in pest control, like maybe you do want me spraying the chemicals. Maybe you do want like the guy who knows what he's doing to come in and kill bed bugs because I am like emotionally responsible. I can, I can talk to you about your problems. I can do all this stuff. And we need these good people in these less than ideal industries. Um, and then we've got this leg up because we are college educated people who can do website, who are, who are taught how to learn and can make these businesses. And I have realized that like starting my own business, like that's the American dream, not to have a house, not to have the white picket fence, not to do all that stuff, like to start the business, to feel that power, to make your own schedule, to like build a thing that is yours is so great. Um, so I've worked for Termix for two years and I found a niche. Um, they use chemical to kill bed bugs, but if chemical doesn't work, then they come in with a, a steam heater. So I just started using that. And so I get to do heat treat killing bed bugs. And we just started, I started bite back in 2011. And then in 2014, I brought on a partner, we extended to Boulder. And now we're also in Boston and Las Vegas. And I, I did the numbers, like it's crazy. Um, we have saved something like the amount of aerosol of pesticide dust and of pesticide spray that we have saved doing it our way. It's thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds, um, which is really cool. And not only that, like I've got to hire people in my friend group or not who needed this gig. Like the gig economy is really big right now, especially for our generation. Like it's not just one job a lot of times. I don't like having all my eggs in one basket. I want multiple jobs. So if like one job falls, I'm still held by these other two. Like right now, I like I own bite back bed bug removal. I own fully human SEO and I've been ranching. I've got three things right there. And the ranching just fell through because it's the end of the season. And like, cool, now I work on the bed bug thing and I work on the SEO thing. And I love this gig economy thing. And it allows me to um, to, to do what I want to do outside of this too. Like my, the people I've hired are artists, they're musicians, they're herbalists, um, they're personal trainers. This is, allows them to have the money so they can then do their passion. Because maybe job doesn't always have to be passion. Passion doesn't always have to be job. Maybe just allowing a job to create room for your passion so then you can do the work is, is what it is. And if I can give somebody that ability to do what they love by creating a job for them in which they can do that, like that's the social entrepreneurship aspect of it right there. Um, I mean, outside of the chemical, outside of just like calming people down when they have bed bugs, like I get to do that. And it's really cool. Um, and for that, like it was, it was all about low overhead for me because I realized uh, like the debt crisis. Like, we don't talk about student debt a lot, but Right now, I think I read that um, the average American has $38,000 worth of debt right now, and like, including mortgages, 87% of Americans are in debt. And I was super fortunate enough to get out of college without any debt. And I decided, like, I think my father told me one day that, like, if I have $1 to my name, I'm doing better than the vast majority of society who has all this crushing debt. And I found this industry where I don't have to make a storefront. I don't have to buy tables and chairs and all this stuff. I can buy this one little machine. I can get this one set of skills and I have my time. And I just use my time as a commodity. And I learned the SEO through that. Like this is like the vertical integration aspect of it. I was cheap and I didn't want to hire somebody to do my SEO. So I learned how to do that. Five years later, somebody saw me doing that, saw how good I was doing and then hired me to do that for them. And then that just kind of spiraled and did that. And just roll it. And I'd like to think that any industry I could have found this niche. Like I killed bed bugs, and, but like, and I worked at Terminex, and I found this niche that I could get into and use my ability that I learned at Westminster everywhere to just like learn how to learn. Perhaps I didn't learn the skills, the the, the tangible skills I wanted, but I learned that I can do anything. Like that's the liberal arts education. Like. I got mad after I got out of college because I didn't know the stuff, but then I just realized how capable we are. Like we think that what is happening in college, like the way we write, the way we speak is normal and you come out and it's really not like we are exceptional human beings that get the privilege to go to college. And, and it is such a privilege and it's just a superpower that we have to do whatever we want. And it doesn't have to look one way or the other. And it's so exciting to have all those options open because that's what 
a huge part of my life is about is just choice. I want choice in everything I do. Um, I'm slightly obsessed with it to the point of like living in a van because I wanted to be able to go wherever I wanted. I want to be able to work whenever I did or didn't want to. And I didn't care. I wasn't in debt and I didn't care much about money. Um, we don't have to make as much money as you think. Like I was taught to like, look at the jobs that make money and get one of those jobs. And right now this year, I think I'm, I'm going to, I'm on pace to make about $26,000 this year. And I'm going to save about $10,000 of that because I've created a life where I don't have a mortgage. I don't have rent. I don't have electric bill. I don't have internet bill. I like planted my own food. So I don't have a food bill. Um, and then like, I just get to feel this like empowerment that, that this is, this is me and my community that did this and we need each other to help do this. And so I'm creating a really beautiful community on top of all this. Um, and it's just really pretty. <laughs> um, and it left room for my passions. And one of the passions was to be a writer. That's what I wanted to be for a long time. And my senior thesis in English was I went to three different communes in Missouri. They exist in Missouri. I went to a religious one, an ecological one, and a hippie one. And I just stayed there all summer with these people. And I came back and I thought it was just going to be my 80 page thesis. And I wrote 80 pages and I was a third of the way done. So I decided just keep going. This might be the only time I get to do it. And I would highly suggest if I can do a little advice, like if they offer a thesis, do the thesis. Um, it is a beautiful, tangible thing that you can take a year making that is all your own that you can just transfer into everything else. It's a beautiful program. There's not many undergrads that do it actually. Everybody's like super excited that I actually got to do it. They think I went to grad school and I didn't, but Westminster is great in that one. Um, but in those communes, like it was really beautiful because the idea that I learned is like, this is happening. They say it can't happen. It is happening. Like they say we, we need the job. We need the, the cost codes. We need all this and we don't it's working whether you like it's got its own downfalls too for sure but you can't say it's not working like you do not need this and so then when i got out of the communes i it was my choice to be here now now i could be in this version of civilization and know that i'm not stuck here that i chose to be here and that kind of meant everything and i, I just learned so much in each of these communes like the um the one was just mainly a farming commune. It's in Northern Missouri. And I just learned that this is anarchy. Like these people are there because they are revolutionary anarchists farming soybeans. Because there's two ways. Like right now we're seeing some rioters and stuff like that. they throw rocks at the system and the system throws rocks right back. And this one kind of relies on this one to throw so they can throw back and blame this one for that one. Or you can just prove that you don't need them. You can make your own shoes. I started doing leather work. I've made my own moccasins, my own Nalgene sling. I've made like gloves, fur lined leather boots out of rabbits that I've raised and ate. Like you just prove that you don't need them. And it was so great seeing this guy. Like I asked why he was here at this commune. He's like, hasta la revolucion. And he's legitimately just like, and now I have to go farm soybeans. Um, it was, it blew my mind. Cause I was like a Che Guevara wearing shirt guy. Um, and then after that, I was like, oh, I, I see this now. Like. It's, it's the whole Gandhi thing, the be the change you want to see, the walking the walk, the living the thing. And, and to, to live this, this idea is everything. You can talk as much as you want about it. And there's a lot of people talking right now and very few that are feeding the chickens every day. And that needs to happen. <laughs> um, and an East, East Wind is one of the ones down south. It was the old hippie one. And that was wildly interesting because they do full sharing. You go in, you take a shower and there's just, then you walk out and there's just racks of clothes that you can just wear. You have to put in like 20 hours a week at one of their little things. You can either cook, you can do anything. Um, and it was really pretty, but also you have all these travelers that came to build this thing and now they're kind of stuck there because they took all this money that they had, they put it here. And now they're just kind of stuck in this paradise. Um, Cause I've, I've been obsessed with community making. I just want to, I, I, I love people. I, I love my crew of people. I want to create something with them. And so I've been going to these places trying to figure out like, what does that community look like for me? And it didn't look like the full sharing like I thought it would be because I realized that that doesn't allow movement of any kind. And all of the people that I love are fairies <laughs> who love to move. And um, like, how do you do this? And then I went to one that was a religious one called the 12 tribes, it's in Warsaw. And that was interesting 
because it's commune slash cult a little bit, but they, they're beautiful. They like dance together, they cook together, they work together, they make jokes without degrading each other. And it's really pretty. And I, I sat there after I left, like without much religious belief, but wondering if like the ends justify the means here. Like if they're, if they're doing this this way, like maybe this is matter, like maybe this is okay. But then I just realized I can take all these, like I can, t like I can, I can take all the, 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 the results and, and find a new way to create them. Um, and it was really cool. I learned too in this, that I, it was normal society, the normal quote unquote normal society. I would go to these communes and they're just farming. They're just hanging out by the Creek. They're just doing this stuff. We have this like connotation of sex and drugs and craziness and it's not there. They're just farmers usually. And you come back to the city and you find, you go out on a Friday night in Denver and like, there's the sex, there's the drugs, there's all the stuff. Like there's no normal at all. Like end that idea right now. <laughs> um, and you're not normal, nothing is. And so once you kind of lose that desire to be normal, lose that desire to fit in, it opens up everything. You can just get to go wherever, do whatever, be with whoever you want, choose it to be here like fully. And um, it's, it's meant everything to me. And then when I finished the book, I tried to publish it. And if anybody's thinking about publishing a book, it's probably worth it. It was also, it's a very harsh process. You distill your entire life's work into a query, which is like less than a page. And then you send that to agents who get about a hundred queries a day sometimes. They get to choose 12 a year. And they have to do that same process to a publisher who then if you're lucky, they send you on, a, they get it, they send you on a book tour where you won't make any money. And then if you're lucky, they'll put you on contract to write another book within a certain amount of time. And then if you're lucky, they'll put you on a book tour again. And I realized when I thought of that, that's the best case scenario. I don't really want a part of it. Um, maybe I just self-publish and have it be like a book in the sand. If somebody sees this and randomly stumbles across it, like, great this was not for them anyway. This, this book was a way for me to process what just happened to me. Um, not for me to make money, not for me to be famous, anything like that. So I just ended up self publishing and it was honestly a great idea. It'd still be cool if I was published and millions of people read my book, but that's honestly not statistically not going to happen. <laughs> um, and this way I just got to take away that expectation of myself. I got to take away this desire for it to be something. I just got to let it be um, and know that it was just for me now. And um, it was not hard anymore. There are so many people doing this. You buy an ISBN number for like $70. You go to Nook and Kindle. They'll convert it into their thing. I made it into an audiobook. I had friends and family do the voices, and I did the narration. I made an audiobook that's free on Bandcamp now. And it's just great. Um, I don't have any problem with that. And again, it's this expectation thing. It's like if you're going to be an author, you must be published. And that's just not true. You know, I don't need to go to Carnegie Mellon to be a musician. I can just pluck around a ukulele and I can call myself a musician. That's fine. That's enough. It's all enough. Um, but then after I wrote the book, I stopped writing for a long time because I found myself writing for other people. Like in college, you are giving this to the professor and the professor is then grading it. And then you get validation or not on that grade. And then you find yourself like writing for other people and other things. And then you like look around and all of a sudden you're in the city and there's advertisements and there's TV and there's all this stuff. And after a while I wondered like, am I making a decision of my own? How have I made a decision of my own in a long time? I wasn't sure because I just know that I've had so many distractions. I've had so many influences. I've had, I had just so much thrown at me that I just couldn't even decipher what was mine and what wasn't mine anymore. And that's what led to the van life. Um, so I've been, I built out a Sprinter van three years ago um, and then lived in that for the last three years, essentially. Um, I had never done hardly any building projects before I built this thing out. I built a really bad chicken coop and a pretty decent rabbit coop. And then all of a sudden I was able to build this van that I now live in. Um, and it was great, it's super empowering because YouTube is awesome. Everything you ever want to learn is right there. They're like any plumber, anybody, they don't have any magical plumbing skill powers. They just are people that did a thing. And if you just do the thing, you will learn how to do the thing. I was so caught up in like, I need to learn how to do this so I can do this. And after a while I was like, no, I just need to do it. 
Um, and when you're doing it, you're just, we're monkeys. We will monkey around and make stuff fit. And it worked. And um, yeah, I spent two years in the Sprinter van. I got to the point when my bike back business where I could just manage remotely while I hired somebody else to do that. And I went from Colorado, Maine, Florida, California, down to Texas. I've um, helped build tiny homes. I've gone to ranches and gardens. I've gone to movement gyms and learned aerial silks and parkour and trampoline acrobats. I tried to surf. It was way too cold in Southern California and Florida. Don't try to surf then. Um, and um, yeah, I'm not gonna stop for a little bit, I don't think. <laughs> um, I really dig it. It's been great. I've learned so much. Um, not only the capability, but I, I wanted to, I realized that I had to be home, like at a house to feel at home. I had to be at a house in a specific location until I could relax enough to feel at home. And I didn't like that. I didn't feel like that was right. Like I wanted to be my home. I wanted to be able to find that within me. I wanted to be able to find that anywhere. And after these two years in the van, like the United States is my home and I am my home. Like I need a roof, but like everything that we think the physical things give us is just an internal manifestation of thereof. Like that's just an idea that we have decided calms us. People think alcohol sets them free or weed sets them free and tea can set you free just as well. If you just mentally decide that that's what it's going to happen, this is all mental. Um, and the van life really helped me do that. It really helped me switch into like the, the world is my home. I am my home. I am capable wherever I want to be and to do whatever I want. I, have been able to like minimize my footprint so much. Um, and I'm at the point now where I wanted to like minimize footprint or get to like, you know, zero. And right now I'm, I just read a book called Grandfather by Tom Brown Jr. And it was saying like, that's not enough either. Like we have the ability to make this world better. Like not just the world, like, and not people, like we have the, the, the physical world and we're so worried about the spiritual aspect. We're so in our, our heads all the time. And like, we forget to floss, you know, like before, you worry about your Ferrari, maybe, maybe floss every day. <laughs> uh, and before you worry about your house, maybe make sure the tree in the backyard is pruned very nicely, you know? And I, I really, really, I just actually spent three days alone under a tree, um, just camping with nothing except a saw. So all I had to do was like trim this tree and I want to make my land the home. I want to give back to that thing. I want to go beyond net zero. I want to go net positive on this thing. I want the world to be better. Like, I want the nature to be better. I want people to be better because I was here. And we can do that. Um, I think Alan Watts has a thing. We are locusts and grasshoppers are the same thing. It's just a mentality. Whenever the grasshoppers think they don't have enough food, they swarm, and then they all go crazy, and they eat everything, and then they all die because that's what happens. Whereas the grasshoppers are the same insect, just that haven't freaked out and know that there's enough food for everybody. And if we convince ourselves that we are locusts, we will act like locusts and we will swarm and we will eat everything, or we can just be grasshoppers. And I tried to sit here in this van, like being a grasshopper or being a rodent. Like I feel like in the van, I was a rodent in all the best ways. Like we have these big ideas of big mansions and big, um, big bedrooms and beds. And it's so unnatural to, our human the animalistic instinct like we are we we burrow we get in small areas every single animal gets in a small little area and, and hunkers in and that's what feels safe and we don't need all this space in fact like when i go to a normal bedroom now i feel exposed i feel like it's too much i feel i feel a lot of things that aren't good <laughs> um and that van life really helped me do that uh, i came up with an idea a while ago like the best way to have more is to want less like I can either work all the time, 60 hours a week and to get all these things, or I can just decide that I don't need them all. I can want a whole lot less. And then all of a sudden, everything's a blessing. Now, after three years of van life, if I go to somebody's house and they have running water, like just off the tap that are different temperatures. That is so cool. <laughs> like we, we take so much for granted here and we are so blessed. Are you kidding me? Like we live better than Kings lived by far we have insulation in our houses we have penicillin that's really neat and we have modern medicine and we are like it's just it's cool it really helps you put things into perspective um and i just wanted to go on that road and find community i wanted to find people that were doing things that i was interested in i, I went on the van with the intention of not of to learn exactly how to build a house or learn to do things i went with the intention of like i want to pay attention and then i will learn just by paying attention. And I want to be active. 
which I will be because I can't be in the van all the time. And so two and a half years later now, I mean, it, it's kind of happened. I have a wildly large community. I can go to pretty much any state and have somebody there that will host me and be happy to see me. I have a larger skill set because I've been sitting here learning from people as I go. I'm stronger and healthier because I've been eating well and hiking. I feel like I'm like so much more autonomous. Like I can, I can handle like anything that's thrown my way. If there's, you know, people screaming at 3 a.m., like I can sleep through that. If I, I can do most anything. I can pass the time. Like I can just sit there in a waiting room and not stare at my phone and just stare at the wall into the void for a while. And that's a superpower right there. Um, I kind of learned to be okay with the futility. Like we, we have this like grandiose idea of our lives being meaningful and they are in their own way. Also, it's all, we're going somewhere and doing something. And also we're all going to die. And we're not going anywhere on this little spaceship earth. Um, and sometimes that's hard to, to come to terms with. Um, but also it's so freeing. It's like futility, this nihilism. There's, there's such a determinism. There's such a freeing aspect into, uh, of it where like, I don't really have to try. Um, like Alan Watts again talks about how like a cat will cat and a dog will dog. You can trust a dog to dog and a cat will cat and a glass will glass and tea will tea and a human will human. And we think that we have to be in charge of everything. We have to be driving this bus and like, uh-oh, like we have to steer every, every way. And like, and we don't. Uh, we are humans who will human. We have natural instincts that will make us, and laws of survival that will make us be fine and honestly do things probably better than we would in our cerebral. Um, and so that innate self that we can like trust to just be a human and in doing so, we'll help other people. We don't need certain things to prove. We don't need laws. We don't need religion to give us morality. Like, it's there. We have a desire. To, we, are, we are Pax animals. We are tribe. And we have that in us. And if we just can trust that and trust that we are held, but it's so, we're so far separated from it right now, I feel. We're so far separated from, from the idea of community. We're in our suburban neighborhoods. We have fences surrounding everything. We sit inside. And, you know, when, when we're shoveling snow, we stop right at the borderline of the other person's property. We stop right there. And I wanted to get away from that. Um, I wanted to feel what it's like to just have community because at the end of the day, I'm just, I just want to love this world and these people more. And one of the greatest ways to love the people more is to help them survive. <laughs> um, I went to a primitive skills school and I watched the fire while somebody slept and then we set an alarm and then uh, she woke up and watched the fire while I slept and I love that person forever. I ended up being a pen pal with her for about two years like because that's it like this is all this stuff we we think that we need to get all these things so we can insulate ourselves and protect ourselves from the outside world and I'm sitting here like I'm trying to like open myself up to the outside world and trust it and you got to learn who to trust and how, and you'll get burned. Um, but it's so worth it. Um, everything about it. Uh, I just can't even, <laughs> I can't even express how worth it that is. And now like, I love, like, I love the United States more. We have all this stuff happening and it's easy to like hate where we're from. But if you just like, travel this world, like, Oh my God, it's so gorgeous. There's so many places from Utah to Maine to, I mean, every single state it's out of control and the people are there. They're everywhere that you're kind of people, they're doing what you want to do. Like whatever freaky weird thing you're in, somebody else is into it. Now we have the internet so you can find them um, and you can do freaky weird things with them. And it's neat. Um, and it just helps. And then I learned, a big one I learned is just like empathy in the van. One time my van broke down. When your van is your house and then your van breaks down, your house is gone. And you go from being the cool van life guy to being homeless real fast within like an hour and then all of a sudden like you're in your dirty clothes which were endearing before but now you realize that you kind of look crazy and then you're in like an extended stay in like the middle of nowhere and it's wild and you realize like this is how easy it is for the homeless people this is how easy it is um to get like lost in the system and nobody kind of cares like there's not much caring um, and it's so easy for us to not be able to empathize with that because we are so privileged to not have all of us haven't experienced stuff like that. 
And I just want to sit here and experience everything. I feel like if I have a duty in life, is it is it's to experience it as much as I can, so I can get as much empathy as I can, so I can lose the fear of that thing. Then once the fear is gone, and then there's just pretty much love left after that, because then it's an understanding of them and of yourself and of how, uh, your ability to interact with them, and it's just love after that. I've learned uh, like about police brutality a little bit because there was a, this winter, there was an article that came out that said, white men in white vans will rape you and steal you away. Like there, it was all over Facebook. And I got pulled over three times in like a month long span. Once I was just with my partner having breakfast and like the cop came up and just like, it was just like that. They. They're like, what, what, what's the problem here? He's like, I, I, I don't know, I'm eating breakfast, <laughs> you know? And he's like, no, I mean, don't get an attitude with me. But because and I said, like, what is happening? And I realized like I was called in as a threat from somebody else. So that now I am being perceived as a threat. And in being perceived as a threat, I am now feeling like a victim of that perception of me. And now I have this perception as a threat by a stranger with a gun. And like, it's just that easy. I'm not saying this happens all the time, police officers are great, all the things, but like, this is how real it is and how easy that switch flips. Um, and like, you just get so much more empathy with it when you put yourself in every situation. Um, and like, I know my mom's probably on here and she's just like, hates to hear about this, but I told her a while ago, I was like, don't pray for my safety, like pray for my courage. Um, this is what I'm asking for right now. Um, and I am safe like out there. Like, the world is not as scary as the news makes you think it is. Um, for every, for every piece of bad news on there is, if you just don't watch it, you, you go around the world, you see that just people want to help you. They want, if, if you just tell them you're a rancher, I, I, I decided I want to be a rancher. I just told people I was a rancher now. Um, and they just wanted to hook me up with every single one of their friends that did that. And those people wanted me to learn because they have this passion. So they offered me to come. This is how I got to the communes. I just like went up to them. I, on the internet. And I said, like, this is what I'm doing. I want to learn about what you're doing. Well, can I come stay? And they said, yes. And a few said no, and no hard feelings go along with your day. Um, and now, like, now, now that, I don't know, the, the book is done, all this stuff, I'm focused on three things mainly in life. And that's, um, one of them is death work right now. That's what I'm trying to get a lot into. I'm realizing that, um, like, you get so overwhelmed. Like I wanted to change the world all the way when I was a kid, um, still do, but I'm doing it in this different way because it's so easy to get overwhelmed. You see so much that needs to change and I see so many people trying so hard and they get frustrated because the world's not changing all the way. And um, yeah, you're, you're just going to lose it. You know, the children of the sixties, like grew up in, like to, you know, a lot of them like lost that, that luster of it. Um, and you just get overwhelmed. So I decided to just focus on three things. Like I will focus on three things. I will do those three things well. And one of the things I'm trying to do is death work. Um, so right now I don't feel like our culture handles death very well. And I feel like that's one of the main problems. Like to confront your death is to confront life. To find purpose in death is to find purpose in life. Um, and I just, I don't think we're doing that. I don't like funerals. I feel like right now, like our, we live in a magical world. I realized um, when I was killing, when I, was, I was raising rabbits so I can kill them, eat them, use their fur. And it's a wild thing to kill your own animals. Um, and the last thing I realized was, like, am I worth it, is what I was asking after I did this. Like, am I worth it? Like, you know how much, how many cows, how many chickens, how many rabbits, how many pigs I'm going to ingest, how much sacred water, sacred, sacred like, um, oil to get me places. Uh, avocados like will I have to ingest to live and am I worth it and I think the answer is obviously no um, but we live on a magical planet that somehow gives so much more than we need and all it's really asking for is our bones all it really wants for all that that we get that we don't deserve but nothing deserves it like the fox doesn't deserve it the bear doesn't deserve it I don't like we're if I don't deserve it, nothing else does either. And it kind of, it's this weird mind game. Um, but yeah, like the world only asks for our bones. We're not even given that anymore. Like we're, we're burning them or we're, 
putting them in mausoleums, we're putting formaldehyde in them, then we're putting them in a church and having them presided over by a person that didn't even know that, that the, the, the deceased. And we're not allowed to like really touch our grandfather's body when he dies. Like we don't, we don't get to grieve because we're not a part of this process. Like when my grandfather died and I got the call and I was just like, okay, what is my job? And I didn't have a job. My job was to go to the funeral and stand there at the front while people said that he was a great man, which was cool, but I didn't feel, I didn't feel like I was able to process it. And then like my dog died and like I, it was my job. I picked that dog up. I made that dog a shroud. I dug that hole. I gave a tobacco ceremony for that dog. And I'm realizing we, we treat our animals better than we treat our grandparents. Um, and it's like, this does not support the grieving process right now. And so this is one of the narratives I want to change. Um, and I, re I, I refuse to believe death is a bad thing. I refuse to believe this narrative that this is awful. I refuse to believe this narrative that we should live forever. Um, it's, it's one of the hardest things in the world is to realize that like the world will be okay without us. Either as humans or as individuals, it will get along just fine. And the greatest work we can do is to die happy. Like we sit here and we practice sports or we practice writing, we practice anything, but nobody practices dying. And if there's one thing that is the biggest thing that will ever happen in this life, it is to die. <laughs> and we don't practice that, but it is being practiced. Um, there are death cafes going on. I've been volunteering for the Crestone End of Life Project, which does open air cremations on a funeral pyre and has the family wildly involved in the cleaning of the body and the preparing of the body. Um, I don't like, we have this idea that we should die peacefully in our sleep. And I don't want that. Like, I want to see my way out. Um, if I have a wish in this world is that I can like breathe my way out and dissipate. And I can practice that. I can practice that with yoga and with breath work. I can practice that with killing my rabbits. I can practice it with death workshops where we just like dissolve into ourselves. And you feel this like wild uh, release when you dissolve yourself and it's not just practicing for death. This is, this is, this is life now. Like you're dissolving ego. You're, you're realizing what matters and what doesn't. Like, I would suggest everybody, like, even if you're 18 years old right now, like write a will out because you'll see real fast when you write a will that your possessions are just somebody else's burdens. If you die, that's all they are. Um, maybe somebody wants your bike, but other than that, like somebody just got to deal with your crap. That's what, like, and we're sitting here working so hard 50 hours a week to get all this stuff that is just at the end of the day, a borrowed thing. It was never yours. And it's just somebody else's burden now. So to like get rid of that was huge to, to, to do this will and to see this this way, to kill the rabbits, to, to watch a body like burn and watch the family actually grieve that process well has been everything. And it's something I really want to change in this world. Um, and there's just so much like perception in death too. Like, like belief is a choice. We have this idea that like belief is truth, but it's a completely a choice because belief is just perception of a thing and perception of a thing is your choice. And once you perceive it differently, like it just changes everything. Like everything is perception. And like when it comes to death work, I wanted to, um, I sat there and decided like, what is it? Like, what, what if I get to choose what happens when I die? Like, what do I actually want? What if it happens if I choose what happens when I live? Like, what do I actually want? And it's cool because what I want, like, like forget the, you know, the being in the clouds or forget reincarnation. Like, I kind of want to just dissolve into everything and into, into darkness. And then, like, once, once you want the darkness, like, everything else is just, everything else is light now. Everything else is a blessing. Um, and I don't know. It's super cool. And I, well, with life... I realized that like, okay, like what if I get a chance, knowing everything I know about the world right now, what if I get a chance to remake the world of my own choosing? Like I get to make everything, the animals, the, the, the idea. And I sat there and I thought about it. I was like, I, I couldn't do any better. This is a magical, magical place. There are seahorses and dragonflies and space. There are unanswerable questions. It goes as far deep down as you want to go. Like there's, there's people, there's your body can do everything. You can do handstands. You can practice anything. Like this is a magical, magical world. And I could not have made it better if I wanted to. Um, and like, I don't really want to live more than 90 years. And like, uh, people have this like resentment that they'll die. But like, do you really want to live forever? Like, do you really want to live for like, really think about it? Like just go down that rabbit hole and think about it. 
and you'll realize that you probably don't. <laughs> and and somehow the world is so crazily cool that it's made us want that almost. Like it's almost like a Stockholm syndrome where we like love our captors, where like because this is what is happening, this is what I wanted all along. If you get down to like the bones of it, which is so cool, you don't have to really change anything. You just have to change your perception of that thing. Um, and that is, and the perception, it's all on you now. I don't have to worry about what my neighbor's doing. I don't have to worry about this. I can love my neighbor. I can do this. Like put it all on your shoulders. We have this idea, like put the weight of the world on your shoulders is gonna crumble you, but it doesn't like, you get to like learn how to balance it properly. And then all of a sudden, like you are in charge of this all, all. You just can't be in charge of what they think, but you can be in charge of what you think and you can turn it into anything. Um, and you can choose, a, like I, I got to this idea where I was thinking, I, I choose a reality in which, and just left it there. And I just like wrote down stuff. Like I choose a reality in which I can do these things and my friends do these things. And this is what happened. And it did not take long for that to happen. Once you learn power manifestation and per the perception leads to manifestation, once you learn that power, it's, it's, it's on, <laughs> like you, you'll just keep going and you can just be anything. You can do anything. You can embody anything. And that's kind of led to the second thing I'm trying to do with my life right now is just like, this like shameless self-expression. Like I want to be able to embody whatever I feel at that moment that is myself, like completely shamelessly. I want to combat this like, toxic masculinity I want to like just I want to feel both the powers of like both genders even like we are x and y chromosomes we are a product of man and woman mother and father like that is in us just because I am like technically a man doesn't mean I'm not a woman also <laughs> and doesn't mean that I don't have the grace that can go with the strength doesn't mean that I can't be pretty as well as handsome doesn't mean that I mean that I don't know, I get excited about this. Um, <laughs> and that's been what I've been trying to do. You see that the nail polish, the earrings, I have, I, I wear eyeliner every once in a while. Sometimes I don't, when I ranch, I don't wear this because that's that's dumb. Um, I wear car hearts, but then if I'm like trying to be flowy and happy, like I'm gonna put on my happy clothes and my little, like the, the flowers I sewed for myself there. Um, and you just like, you can break this whole concept down of what you are supposed to be, what even what gender you're supposed to be. Um, and this has like led to this beautiful like queerness I found um, in life. Um, Cause God damn, like I'm pretty, <laughs> you know? And I can do that and I can, I can see that in other people now. I can, like on the other side of shame, we have this like shame that wants to protect us by saying that this thing is bad or, um, uh, it disguises it. it disguises your shame as virtue almost where like, no, I don't want to do this thing or be this thing because it is bad. Therefore I don't have to process it. I can just believe what I want to believe. And often you'll find that on the other type of side of shame is pleasure. <laughs> um, like it's okay to do all this. It's okay to be pretty. Like it's okay. Um, and all, all this realization led to me, like I was at a dance one, one time. Also everybody should dance. Um, I was at a dance and we blindfolded ourselves and um, started just dancing with people and I would hit people and some people I would interact with and it would be really great and some people it wouldn't be great. I hit this one person and it was so beautiful like we we just moved so well together we trusted each other so well our energies con connected so well and at this point I didn't know who this was I didn't know if this is a man I didn't know if this is a woman I didn't know what they look like I didn't care because like our energies connected and that's all that mattered. And that right there just changed everything for me. Um, Cause all of a sudden, like if it's just our energies, like it, man, woman, like what, whatever, like it doesn't matter at all. It's just, we are energies, we are ourselves. We are not this idea of what a male should be or a idea of what a white guy should be or idea of what anybody should believe. Like we are not those status quos. We are completely energies that either connect or don't. And we can just love based on that. And, and oh man, like when you, then break that down, you lose that fear. And once you lose the fear again, like all that's left is this like desire to like, what have I, what have I been missing? What, what if I really love this? What if, what if, like, why not? I'm not scared and I want to know this stuff. And then wow, like I was, I was, 
I got to have some experiences when I was 30 years old. I broke this open. I got to have the experience with another man in the intimate realm, and it blew my mind because you get to see this, like you get to see this from another angle. You get to see another man right here on you, and it's wild because I mean I'm talking to men right now mainly. Like we don't listen to women um, nearly enough about how vulnerable this is to be in a situation where you are where you are down, where you are being penetrated, where you are all this, like, it's crazy. Um, and it's just another one of those moments where you get to see things from a different angle. You get to experience more and empathize more. And like, I got to feel that trauma. I got to feel the trauma of a man, like unconsensually advancing upon me. And I got to feel like how hard it is to say no, how, like, how unconditional, like love does not beget unconditional access. I got to see like what victim shaming does because he like shamed me for saying no. I got to see, like I got to understand this privilege. And now because I understand that I, I can listen better. I can, I can share this story better. And like, it's so real. And I know in college, like there's, there's drinking and there's just like, like there's so much to learn. And like, if I can say anything like consent culture, like read about consent culture and ask permission and don't, to do, do things on, on like wild amounts of alcohol like it's it's not consensual it's not fun and as men we don't see how how real that is because we're usually the aggressor in the situation but if you get to flip that and have that on you you see how absolutely important this is to to be a person who can um be worthy of trust essentially, and who can empathize and who can show this love and desire for everybody to learn and be healthy and healing from this thing. Um, this led to me also realizing that like, maybe, maybe like monogamy is not for me. I've been polyamorous like, or ethical non-monogamy um, for eight years now because of this same kind of idea. I realized there's poisons. I had a cousin who was an alcoholic and he said the way he got away from alcoholism was to convince himself it was poison. And I said, I said, that's really great. What else is poison in this world? Not just physically, but mentally. I realized that shame is poison and jealousy is poison. The idea of ownership of another person's body is poison. And how do I work on breaking that down? How do I, how do I give my partner the ability to express herself fully, to learn fully, to do whatever she wants, because I decide to trust them. And I have this like compersion, this desire. Uh, compersion is uh, a word that was made up in this community, essentially, because it's the opposite of jealousy. It's the uh, desire to see um, happiness in somebody that is doing something not with you. Um, and like this is why we have feel so much jealousy in this society, because we don't have a word for the opposite of jealousy. Like We just made one up in compersion in this scene. But like, there's not even a word for it. And that, that's poison enough right there. And like in this scene, I, it's all about consent. It's all about making boundaries and finding boundaries. It's about taking certain things off pedestals. It's about loving the process and not the thing itself. Like if I love this thing and only this thing right here in this moment right now, it's going to move. And then I'm not going to love it anymore. I want to love it forever, though. So I love the process of this being here now and moving and where it was. Like I want to love that process, not this thing. And just that little tweak of language. Um, this is what my English major in uh, Westminster just made me really realize the importance of words um, and how we use them. And like, I love you and like, what is you? What is love? What is I? <laughs> what is the, like, what are you doing here? What's the process? Why do you call it a girlfriend? They're not a girl, they're a woman. Like what, and I would just like, I, I started really paying attention to the words I was saying. When you're like wasting time, like that's not a good way to say that either. Like you can say these things different. Like don't lean on these idioms um, because they often don't say what you mean. Um, like play with this idea um, and like play with these, like you don't have to play with these alternative relationship styles or uh, like the queerness, anything like that. But it helps <laughs> it helps just like relieving the fear of it like once the, again once the fear is gone there's nothing left but a intrigue and i think like if you just have intrigue about the world you will never be bored 
you will never be lonely. You will never be hungry because you will, what is this berry? What is this? And you will find out what can be eaten and what cannot. You will fail. You will do everything. You will learn. We will naturally learn and grow if we just let ourselves do that and then let ourselves have permission to go outside of the box, to go outside of the norm and find these things. Um, there's a really great book called Pleasure Activism. And mainly what it talks about is how this pleasure is within us. It's all in us. And the marketers don't really want us to know this. Also, interesting one about marketing. Marketing used to be propaganda, but then after the Nazi Germany, propaganda became a bad word. So they remarketed themselves as marketing. So essentially, when you're looking at marketing, you're just looking at propaganda. And just to change that word around made me really like find out a little bit better of who to trust and whatnot. Um, but with that pleasure activism, you just like, it's all in here. We don't need the car. We don't need the big screen TV. In fact, like if there's a devil in the world, it's TV. If there's a way to waste time in this world completely. It's TV. If you just don't watch TV, you're going to do things and learn things and meet people and be fine. I really feel like the only way that you can waste your life is to watch TV all the time. I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> um, but then, yeah. And once you, once you love this process, like failure becomes part of this process process and you can like break down this entire idea of failure like I do not feel like failure is a it's a necessary word uh, anymore like you learn so much from it and like I I got married and divorced and I don't feel like that divorce was a failure I learned so much in that divorce I had such a good time I, I I've come out of it so much stronger knowing what I want so much better it wasn't failure um, it was, it was just a learning process and it was me getting to experience it. I can now say, I know what it feels like to ask somebody to marry me. I can now say, I know what it feels like to have these hard conversations where you realize that that's not the best thing. Um, I, I, I know more I all I want to do is just like experience everything so I can learn more about this world and love it more. Um, I can just say that as much as I want about just how to learn more is to release the fear because um, it's just so true. And then it just opens up avenues for everything else. Like I, I decided I didn't really, once I decided like the status quo doesn't have to be me, what do I actually want? I decided like, I don't really want to be a father. Like you're taught, especially women are taught like the kid will be the thing and that will be the thing. And I've kind of just sat there with myself like, I don't think it is, but like I could maybe see myself as a co-parent with some friend's kid on some land or maybe even like come in as a step, you know, something or even as a sperm donor. And <laughs> be careful what you tell people sometimes because I told that to a midwife friend of mine who then a year later asked if I wanted to be a sperm donor for her cousin who's like 38 years old, never really happened, time is coming. And I thought about it as I was like ranching and building fences for like a, you know three or four months and I said yes. And a month ago, I got to hold my newborn biological child for the first time. And then I just got to also give it back. <laughs> and I got to just like let somebody who wanted to become a mother, like I got to help her become a mother. And there's nothing I could do better with my time than that. Um, and that's just because I like opened myself up to these other ways that we can do this thing. Like, sure, kids are cool. You do not have to be the primary caregiver. Sure. Like, like intimacy is cool, but it doesn't have to be with just this one person or just this one kind of person. There's so many doors that are open and you can close those doors again. That's what they do. You can open a door and you can close it again. If you didn't like one of those things, you can say, cool, thank you. I will see my way up. And nobody's going to say that's bad. Um, you, I feel like my 20s were about me saying yes to everything. My 30s have been about me saying no. And they're equally amazing. <laughs> um, so uh, let's see, the third thing that I decided I wanted with my life now is just the self-sustainability part of it. I want to be capable of just everything, honestly. I want to be capable of providing for myself. I want to be capable of helping my community provide for each other because that's the game that we've been playing before we were humans. Hundreds of thousands of years we've been humans and before that, like we are animals. I feel like we are trying to separate ourselves so much from being animals that it's hurting us. Like we've, we've created such a disconnect. And um, yeah, I, I want to feel that. Like we are a tribal creature. We, we, our whole reality is based on providing for our basic needs, like food, water, shelter, fire. That's like for thousands and thousands, thousands of years, like that was the game. 
And now we're so far removed from that that it's not really a problem for us. And then, of course, we have existential crises and suffer from depression because we're finding other problems because we have time to think about things that don't matter. Um, so this is why I went to like primitive skills school. I went to like Maine to do a primitive skills school where I learned maybe my own bow, learned to forage, uh, learned just survival techniques. I've been like um, just learning how to cook, do leather work, um, build. I built chicken coops and gardens and compost. And like that's it. Like I feel like so many people like think they're men now because they have big truck and watch football. But like you can't sew though. Like you, if, if your button falls off, you can't sew it back on. You think you're a capable, awesome, strong man, but you can't sew your button back on or you, you can't really cook like outside of like processed mac and cheese. Like, are you capable? Are you man? Like, so I've been like trying to shift that and go back to this self, like before agriculture revolution, before the last 2000 years, this isn't what's been happening forever. Like this is only what's going to happen this, this small amount of time. And it's, it's debatable if this is a good thing or not. <laughs> uh, I look at the world right now and I wonder why we went, came out of the trees sometimes, you know? Um, and there's just so much in the self-sustainability route that you can just play with and explore. Like I realized at the time, like I've never gone a day without food. So I did a three day fast and I just like took control of this like hunger demon within me that I realized had been guiding me. And I realized that I had never spent more than 24 hours alone without talking. And so I went to a cabin for two weeks and just didn't talk and didn't, and, and was just completely alone in this cabin, like chopping my own wood. I stopped watching TV. I started making my garden. I got bees. I like, I got grapevines. Um, and it's just meant everything. Like, you know how good grapes are when you make them yourself and how good meat is when you killed it yourself and how, how fun, like taking the, the poop from the chickens and putting it in the compost and watching it become perfect soil to then grow your tomatoes on and then you eat the tomato like that's everything that is the joy of life is right there and this ability to provide for yourself it's what makes you feel like a, a human and that's it's it like how do I feel more like, like a human I think we're trying to disassociate ourselves from that like how can I be in temperature climate control perfect thing all the time like no like last night I was in like I slept in a teardrop tray in the middle of the mountains in 45 degree weather and it was delightful like I'm a little bit cold slightly uncomfortable but I I feel alive and like that's what matters like I want to I want to feel this thing I want to beat my chest like I want to feel Tarzan stuff with this um and there's a whole movement now called rewilding yourself um and it's like, it's the idea that we've domesticated ourselves. We are now no longer just homo sapiens. We are a domesticated version of those. We breed in captivity. We eat grain. We do all this stuff. And we can kind of like, how do we go feral a little bit? How do we like realize that like maybe like mid birth midwives or um, just like proper movement outside of the gym? Like how do you do handstands? And how do you, how do you fish? How do you do all this stuff? Um, and it's just to get more connected with that process is is connecting yourself to this like ancestry that goes beyond humans that goes beyond apes that goes beyond fish that goes right into the dirt that we were from like the dirt is our ancestor like you dig in the dirt and you are digging your grandparents like your great 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 great, great grandparents and it's just so cool to feel that that familiarity that camaraderie with the entire world and to like create this thing with spirit body mind like nature and like that's it like that's and, and masculine feminine like why are we separating all this why are we finding one little niche and going to it aren't we like like with the infinity glove like avengers stuff like or fucking power rangers <laughs> like we need all this stuff and then like bring it into one spot and then just like shoot it all back out because i feel like that's our job in this world is just entropy like, like since the big bang we were one little speck and then it just blew and the only time it coalesces is to make something that can then spread energy more it's the only time it actually coalesces. And so I came to the realization that, like my job is just to spur energy back out, to take energy in and then spurt it back out. That's all I have to do. And again, it just now those expectations are gone. Um, now I don't have to do anything. And it's, it's so empowering because it freaks you out for a bit. It's like, okay, maybe it doesn't matter. But then you just watch yourself. Like, I don't feel like I made a choice in a long time. I've just been watching myself do the things that I naturally do as a human. And yeah, the self-sustainability has just helped that so much. And then it all becomes so sacred. Like my temple is now everywhere. I don't have to go anywhere. Like I go to the tree and the tree is my temple. That's, that's a cross. And 
like you learn um, just to be in the present moment to like eat the orange like you eat the orange like in the moment you, you fully eat that orange you fully do the dishes like you don't have to you don't have to go anywhere to find this thing like it's everywhere it's in every single process and everything thing you do like forget prayer before the meal the meal is the prayer like it is all the prayer all the time and if you just treat yourself your life everything like that you're just creating your own heaven every day and i just realized that i've been talking for longer than i thought and that we have questions uh, maybe so that's it <laughs> Well, I'd like to thank you, Jacob, for an inspiring and exciting um, talk. Um, I would like to invite questions. If anyone has uh, some questions, feel free to go ahead and type them into the chat. Um, I will ask one question, though. I was kind of inspired earlier when you uh, talked about how uh, living the van life and traveling um, increased your love of the United States. Is there one place in particular that you went that everyone should see, in your opinion? Uh, I'm gonna give you two, because <laughs> that's so hard. But the redwoods, to be able to just like, walk inside a tree, to look up and just see the, the massive, massive old thing that it will outlive you and that has outlived you. I mean, it puts you in perspective. And again, some people like, freak out about the perspective that maybe you don't matter, but it's so freeing if you like really give into it. And then Carlsbad Caverns, is uh, in Southern Utah. And like, I think they say in the main cavern, you can fit like eight Boeing, F, you know, Boeing planes or something. It's wildly cool. So like, and just to go underground, you can go to this like back entrance and walk through this cave pretty much alone if you get there earlier. I got to go there, be the first person and got to walk through this cave for an hour and a half before I saw anybody. And it's just wildly impressive. And yeah, so that's underground and above ground. There's your two. <laughs> I will definitely have to agree. We have uh, quite a bit of impressive uh, landmarks and um, I think we have some great things to offer in this country. Um, so I have to agree with you. Yeah. Um, well, if there is no questions, I'm gonna go ahead and thank you. Uh, thanks again. I would like to invite uh, virtual applause from the audience. Feel free to use your a clap in your um, animations, if you would uh, like to, from wherever you're resident, wherever you're tuning in to our talk today. Um, so thank you, audience, for tuning in. Again, thank you, Jacob. That was very inspiring. And I would uh, just quickly like to remind everyone to tune back in later tonight at 6:15 uh, for our vision and values panel. Um, and with that, on behalf of the Hancock Symposium and um, Westminster College, I would like to uh, thank you uh, for coming back virtually and giving that, uh, that great talk today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Yeah, you too.